It's said that if a man wants to project authority, then he actually wears a dress. <laughs> and you have observed that whether it's religious leader, judges, uh, lawyers, or university professors, that wearing your full robes actually is not that convincing anymore. In fact, I tried it out myself. A few years ago, I brought my academic robe and surprised my children. They were sitting with the three of them on the couch, and so I walked into the room. Uh, there was a few seconds where they were not aware where they were, who they were watching. Then they recognized me, and they start laughing that loud that all three fell from the couch. So, uh, <laughs> black Santa Claus, I think I was meant. So, that doesn't work anymore. And in fact, uh, what mathematicians sometimes call proof by intimidation is not the modern way to convince people. Trust, authority has to be earned. Now, uh, if you go back to the beginnings of modern science, for instance, the Royal Society, which founded in 1660, and where gentlemen were doing little experiments, it was not at all considered to be that serious. For instance, there's a beautiful passage in the diaries of Samuel Pepys, where he uh, describes the king, Charles II, to actually give the royal charter to the Royal Society, as having great fun about these fellows downriver who are, in his words, are just measuring the weight of air. Now, could you do something more silly than that? Of course, now we would say, well, they were finding fundamental laws about pressure and gases. And indeed, the modern scientific method, where you actually see with your own eyes, or as their motto said in Latin, nullius in verba, so take nobody's word for it, I have to see it myself, actually that was the birth of the modern scientific age. Now, what is science? And I really talk about all the sciences, the humanistic, social, and natural sciences. That's actually something that we call organized skepticism. It's actually belief in the ignorance of the experts. And Francis Crick of DNA fame, uh, together with Watson, the discovery of the shape of the DNA molecule, he had the beautiful saying that any theory that can count for all the facts is wrong. Because some of the facts are always wrong. And that is an important lesson for us to keep. In fact, there's a wonderful example of this that happened a few years ago. Actually, it was hotly debated in the English newspapers. A woman was making breakfast and was cracking an egg. And it turned out the egg had two yolks. That's a small chance, like one in a thousand that it happened. Then she took the second egg, two yolks. The third egg, two yolks. Husband in the kitchen, kid children, fourth egg, pictures, the fifth and the sixth egg. And then actually the news crew came in, there was a big piece in the newspaper. At that moment, all the chicken and eggs experts in the world start to be involved. Well, wait a moment, this might be a chicken that was taking hormones, or perhaps all the eggs were coming from the same chicken, or they were selected in two sides. But you know, all these arguments didn't really reduce this tremendous unlikelihood of one chance of one in a million times a million times a million. That's like throwing a coin 60 times and having it land tails each of them. Completely astronomical small number. Didn't reduce the chance. Till one of these experts was walking through the supermarket and certainly saw boxes, double yolk eggs. <laughs> it's a famous example of what has been called an unknown unknown. You didn't even know these things existed. There's a famous saying projected here by the then U.S. Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, with actually describing the failed invasion of Iraq about the three categories, the known knowns, the thing that we all discussed, the unknown, the known unknowns that you know, yet you don't know it. For instance, if you look something up on a website or an encyclopedia, and then there are the unknown unknowns. And in fact, knowing what you don't know is already a tremendous step forward. For instance, cosmologists are delighted to know that 95% of the universe is unknown to them. 
perhaps you were just the, upper, the last month of our new cosmological measurements, and in fact, this uncertainty was even added. So we know even more precisely what we don't know. We call it dark matter, we call it dark energy, but these are just fancy names to label our own ignorance. And often I ask people, what's your percentage of, so to say, dark knowledge? What do you know that you don't know? In some sense, we are all in the, in the field of knowledge, like these old map makers that made a map of the Earth, but only knew a little part of it. And the rest of it, they, they just were too scared to leave it open and empty. So what they did, they painted in you know, horrible sea monsters, projections of their ignorance. And in some sense, we are all floating in that back big sea. And what we're trying to do is one by one, scare away the sea monsters that are out there. Now, if you uh, think about the relation of science, but actually it's also true for politics or judiciary or religion, I think we're changing in a different style. I think the old days, you would have the people who represent that field, they're on one side, say they're here on the stage, and the other side, the society is there in the public. These days, it's not that easy anymore. I don't know what I'm talking to, who am I talking to? Perhaps one of you is a professor of the philosophy of science. Another of you might be a musician. And a third one could be a musician that knows everything about philosophy of science. Knowledge is, in some sense, available in much different quantities and it's mixed together. So the very strict border between, for instance, science and society, which is really was black and white, including the dress that goes along with it, is changing. It becomes much more fractal. The boundary becomes vague. And in some sense, all of you are becoming a little bit like a scientist. You're becoming skeptical. You want to know why things work. And my point, actually, is that this is a great thing. Now, these days, we're kind of, people said we live in the, uh, all, we study all in the University of Google. Information is everywhere. Now, it's the famous global village. And there's a great saying of a particle theorist that I very much admire, Sidney Coleman, who said, the problem with the global village is all the global village idiots. <laughs> so is this a good or a bad thing that all this information is around? Some people argue it's the greatest thing that ever happened. You know, you, anybody can now actually read anything. It's all there on the touch of your screen. Others deplore it. It's the end of culture. And then the third group says, well, it doesn't matter. In some sense, it's just as the invention of print and books. It reminds me of the three reasons to have a drink. One reason is to be festive and celebrate a wonderful occasion. The second one is to drown your misery. And the third one is to uh, do something on a completely uneventful day. Anyhow, you will have your drink. And so I think it is with information that's around us. It's a new world that we have to live in. Now, that means also that we have you know, a way in which we have to talk about the trust in science. And here, too, we can trust science too much or too little. Uh, too little, for instance, by always demanding new investigations. Some people are taking a page for the long battle that was there in fighting tobacco. The tobacco industry, there's a famous quote where in one of their internal documents, they write, doubt is our product. We can, all you can do is make people doubt because the evidence was so overwhelming. On the other hand, you can trust science too much. Astrology, for instance, is basically science carries too much further. If you think you need a human sacrifice for the sun to rise, indeed it works you know, every time. You don't even want to try other things. And perhaps some branches of economics are taking a little bit the form of astrology. So we have to find a good balance there. And this is particular, I think, sensitive for politicians who are not only interested in what the sciences are saying, but also what the public is thinking and how one effect multiplies in the minds of many. And of course, sometimes they're very afraid to even address these issues. Because simply, if you are in a debate, if you're one-on-one, -on -one, then actually any of these discussions will end in a draw. One person could have 10,000 of scientists behind him. The other one could just be making things up 
in the television format or something, you simply will not be able to convince people. So what should you do? That's a very difficult question. And I think my message is that you should go out and reach out and spread out and engage people and try to explain to them what you're doing. Whether you're a politician, whether you're a lawyer or whether you're a scientist. And you can look at examples in the past. Uh, for instance, to give a very bizarre example, Johan de Witt, which was one of our prime ministers, uh, when he wanted to insure from the state, uh, basically uh, life insurance, he had to explain to the people what probability was. And actually he wrote one of the first books of probability. That's quite amazing. Can you think a prime minister writing a scientific thesis to explain the public what the policy actions were? Now, actually, the year after that, he and his brother were very brutally lynched and murdered in one of the blackest pages of our history. So I don't want to uh, make this example too much of an encouragement to politicians. But I think actually it shows you can do this. You can reach out and you can explain things. And you can be like these crazy people, these fellows of the Royal Society, doing their little experiments weighing air. So I want to close actually by doing one of these small experiments. And it's actually one of my favorite ones. And perhaps you have seen it once. It's something that you can, it's my take home message. So what you do, you will take a little plastic bag and you fill it with water. And then you take this lighter. So a little flame. And of course we're gonna do, we're gonna burn a hole in the plastic bag. Now, this works even much more spectacular if you have a volunteer and you do this on top of the head of the volunteer. I won't do it here, but certainly if you want to do it at home, please do so. It gives some extra excitement. So then, of course, you can ask, what happens if you do this experiment? So let's do it. So I light the flame and try to burn a hole. You see, I'm not very successful in doing this. Nothing happens. So what did we learn? Well, here is a standard story. The standard story, you now learned a little bit of physics. What you learned is that it's very difficult to heat up water. Now, if you have a kettle on the fire and it's filled with water, and you have it there for a minute, you know it will not be very hot. If it's empty, it will be very hot. You can burn your hand. So you see some of the fundamental laws of nature demonstrated before your own eyes. One physicist said, you know, science is magic without magic. It's a, an act of magic that always works. So I once demonstrated this on television. I thought very great that I did this because it's something very visible and can, people can do this at home. And then the next morning I looked at my email and there was an email message with one of a famous Dutch physicist. I said, oh, I saw you on television. I liked what you were saying and doing, but you gave completely the wrong explanation of your experiment. I thought, oh, no, 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 it's a, it's a horrible thing. I even said, said the, wrong, the wrong things. I spread wrong ideas, horrible thing to do. He said, no, 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 because why did you show this experiment? It was not about learning the laws of heat or temperature or water. Why were you so confident to do this? In fact, on top of a other person sitting on this table. Because you trusted in science. And that's a lesson we can all learn. Thank you very much.